This is my talk on shift left security. Uh, over the last few years, uh, I've seen presentations and, and tweets, and people mentioned you should shift left security. Uh, and I've been dealing with security, and I thought, so, yeah, what do you mean by that? So I started investigating and came to the following. So who am I? I'm uh, Gerard de Vos, uh, based in The Hague, uh, work usually in Amsterdam. And I mostly work as a sysadmin or a systems engineer. Although at organizations that don't do DevOps, they call me a DevOps engineer. Uh, and over the years, I've often wear uh, the security hat. I've never been a security person, but I have to deal with it because I was given the, like, the security lead or uh, team lead or did designs and reacted to uh, events. And of course, when you run stuff on the internet, you deal with security uh, sooner or later anyway. <laughs> Uh, and I've often worked in uh, online and regulated environments and regulated like uh, banks mostly and insurance companies. And I've learned a thing or two uh, through the DevOps uh, community in Amsterdam with the meetups and the DevOps Days conference. So let's break it down. So what is shift left? Uh, well, this is a picture of a value stream diagram and the idea is that uh, work comes in uh, to your organization or your department and at the end on the right it goes out and the idea is that there's less security work on the right and more on the left that if you ever worked in a larger project you probably recognize a diagram like this uh, where, where it breaks down where all the things that need to be done to go live and of course, security is somewhere over here. And if you worked in a large project, you probably also recognize that all the lines tend to shift, except the go live date, that stays the same. And then you have even less work for security. So that is the, the moving left. But why, why, why would you do that? Well, if you do the security work only at the end, it's, uh, it's much more expensive uh, to fix anything as it, uh, because uh, you're far removed from the planning and the building and you're already in the testing phase, it gets much harder to, uh, to change anything. And because it gets harder, um, it's often then uh, left out entirely. So it's not just that it's, it's harder, it's, uh, you're missing stuff. And this is when the organization actually is working quite well. This already happens. So once you get pride and personal goals uh, into it, uh, or departmental goals, or you're working with multiple companies, then it gets even harder than, than it already is. So that's the incentive for shifting left, moving the security work more to the left. Uh, through the DevOps work uh, and the lean world, we've heard about um, wor working in smaller batches. So that's one way of uh, shifting it left. So instead of having very long timelines um, with months between planning and putting it on production, we now try to do deploy to production much more often, uh, which also means that you do uh, the security work much more often. So that's one way of uh, moving it left, is by just having smaller projects, you, it's just your normal way a week, and you have like a sprint, and you deploy to production at the end of the sprint, and in that sprint you already incorporate the security work. And because it's smaller batches, it's, it's easier and closer to the built-in design. The other way of shifting it left is to find out new ways of working. So, uh, so you still have the, the same timelines, preferably you have shorter timelines, but now when you do a design, you already uh, incorporate the security requirements. Uh, when you do a build, you already uh, include a security work. When you do the test, you include the security work. Um, so it's new ways of, of working that gets added to make this happen. Of course, most development teams are now working agile, but then the rest of the organization is not, which is known as water scrum fall. 
So you still have very long timelines, but then the Agile teams, uh, they work in sprints and quick reviews or retrospectives, but then security is probably still here or maybe here where everything is on fire. Um, so that's one of the challenges in there. So there's broadly two different views on this, um, two worlds, um, and they're both true. And one is, and that's a very DevOps way of thinking, is that security is a quality attribute. And because it's a quality attribute, it's part of your everyday work. Um, so everybody has different work, but security should be a small part of that. And then the other view is that security is a specialty. And when you look at some of the exploits out there, then it's yeah, quite obvious that most engineers or developers or planners would never have thought of uh, uh, such an exploit even. And it takes very specialized people uh, to make sense of it and to discover it. <coughs> um, so these are the, the two ways I'm... Uh, uh, yeah, discover a little bit. Okay. So, security as a quality attribute means that it's everybody's job. So, you, as, you, as a developer, you cannot say that that's security's job or that's the other department's job. As an operations engineer, it's, uh, you cannot say that somebody else should do that. It's everybody's job. Of course, you have to learn about it, so for some people, it's higher on their uh, agenda than other, but it's still everybody's job to think about security and work on security. <coughs> so how do you do, actually do that? Because uh, I usually see in the presentations, yes, you, you should just shift it left. So uh, this is how you can actually do that. Uh, for a long time, this slide was not even in here because I thought it was so obvious to use CI, CD pipelines that everybody was doing it except where you go out in the world. That's not true. A lot of organizations and teams don't have CI, CD pipelines. And this is an important thing for security um, because when you use automated ways of going from uh, code to what's running on production, then you also have a very controlled way of doing that. And we like it because it, uh, you make less mistakes uh, but it also works for security because the stuff you've done on dev, tests, and acceptance is the same thing you're going to do on production, at least, hopefully. <coughs> uh, so you should automate as much as you can, but not everything. That's the other one. A big thing with auditors and security personnel is that not one person um, has the power to change um, uh, yeah, in production. It's called the, the four eyes principle or the two person rule. And the idea is that there's always another person that looks at the work and gives an okay or not okay or uh, suggestions on what should change. Anybody recognize the picture on the right? What is it? War games. Exactly. So this is the opening scene of war games where there's two missile uh, operators and they both have to turn the key before the missile launches. One refuses and this one's tr trying to convince the other one to turn the key. It doesn't work. <coughs> and then you replace everything by computers and it's fine, right? That was the movie. <laughs> so it's shoot to the left, not shoot to the left. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope that uh, your work is less dramatic than people having guns to your head. Uh, but the two-person rule that we have is uh, uh, usually in two places. So once in the development cycle uh, and what's grown from pretty much non-existent to the normal way of working is pull requests. So instead of you uh, yourself merging directly to master, uh, you open a pull request and it has like a couple of uh, things in there that your uh, changes should uh, confirm to before it's allowed to master. And usually that's an approval from another person. So. The other one is uh, in the deployment. 
So in your pipeline, you see CI/CD pipeline uh, de deployed to production should not be automatic. It should, uh, or at least one of the stages should not be automatic. It should have another person looking at it and specifically approving to go. And it could be that uh, to production is automatic, but then, for instance, acceptance is not automatic. Uh, and this is uh, the stuff that auditors, uh, security people really like, so uh, that it cannot be a single person that does this. Well, this should be uh, uh, common, at least by now, for everybody here, uh, that you use tools to, uh, to de deploy everything. And we wanted to track, so it should all be in Git. So it's not just the application code, but all the infrastructure code should be in Git as well. Uh, whether it's Terraform or Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Chief Engine, uh, Iskov, uh, what are the other ones? Uh, and preferably, it uses the same CI CD pipelines to also make the changes on the different environments, and including, again, a second person saying OK or Nay. Uh, and then, preferably, everything should be in version control, so also your documentation, your designs. Um, so there's also commits to it, and the changes are tracked uh, because uh, discovery uh, after the fact is an important thing uh, in security. Uh, preferably prevention, but discovery is uh, important, and this helps with that. Static code analysis uh, means uh, you're looking at the code when it's not running, which is uh, ju still just files on disk or in an editor. Uh, and you might have heard of CVEs, the common vulnerability enumerations, that are the exploits that are out there in the wild, in packages, uh, uh, stuff like Heartbleed. But you also have the common weaknesses enumeration, uh, and they look at coding patterns like checking your inputs and handling variables. And, <coughs> uh, and most languages can be scanned automatically uh, if you're using weak uh, coding. Uh, stuff. Um, the OWASP uh, keeps track of a lot of things. Uh, uh, you might uh, probably have heard of the OWASP top 10 with the, the most common vulnerabilities in applications. Um, and they always are a bit sad that the, change, the, uh, the list doesn't change that much because it means we're not learning. Um, and then there's applications like uh, Sonar that can do the, um, the analysis of your code for you and generate a nice report. And you can embed this in the CI-CD pipeline. And it also specifically uh, tests for vulnerabilities. So it's not just bugs and uh, whether you're documenting your code, but it also has, from that uh, CWE list, um, it knows uh, what you should not be doing, and it will specifically mark it if you are doing it. <coughs> and this gives an exit code, and you can put it in your pipeline and just halt the pipeline and make it red uh, when you're uh, putting vulnerabilities in there. Uh, and again, when the second person has to do an approval, he can look at this report and say, well, you might have uh, forget, uh, forgotten a few things. Could you please uh, check this before we uh, approve this uh, merge? The code you write yourself is usually just a couple of percent of the stack you're actually running, if even that, uh, we're mostly um, assembling libraries and functions together that we download from the internet and then uh, make an application that's unique uh, for our team. Uh, but those packages all have vulnerabilities as well. Uh, uh, but luckily, uh, most projects um, have something so you can check for uh, vulnerabilities. And again, the OWASP <coughs> has a tool for it, uh, but loads of languages have their own tools you can just run an NPM audit, uh, and it will tell you uh, yeah, uh, what state your stack is in, and maybe you should update a few of the packages. Not too long ago, there was um, 
Uh, one of the NPM packages got uh, hijacked, or got a new maintainer, added some functionality <laughs> to, what was it, event stream? It was defined by like, cryptocurrency, I think. Yeah. So it was not even uh, trying to steal your information, it was just trying to steal your CPU cycles. And that's one of the nicer exploits then. <laughs> Uh, and again, you can put this in your pipeline, and if it comes up with critical vulnerabilities, you can just halt it. And again, the person doing the approval can say, well, yeah, it's too red for me, I'm not going to allow it. Of course, we're all uh, hiding stuff in containers nowadays. So uh, we still have the whole node application with all the vulnerabilities, uh, except now it's a container and we don't know anymore. Except we do, because uh, security people have not been sitting still, and you can also uh, run scans on your containers. <coughs> and CoreOS has a program called Claire, uh, well, a couple of programs, and it has, again, the same databases from the CWEs and the CVEs, puts it in a local database to speed th uh, things up, and you can run a scan and it just analyzes your container, sees what, what's in there, um, and does an exit zero, if an exit zero, if there's no vulnerabilities, an exit one, if there are, with a nice list. I scanned all the containers I've been building myself for, for work. Uh, they were not vulnerable, because they're mostly very tiny. But luckily, uh, I had an old version of Jenkins, and it only has uh, 243 uh, vulnerabilities. <laughs> of course, it is running on Java, so. Uh, Claire normally runs um, uh, as something you, that you schedule against your repository, but with uh, Claire local scan, you can just run uh, uh, right now a single scan against a single container, so you can put it in your CI CD pipeline. Um, so all the checks didn't find anything, and then we automatically deploy to the test environment. Um, and then it's actually running, it's up and running, and it's not just your code, it's not just the code plus the libraries you pulled in, it's, it's a complete system, which means it's now actually working, but it also means there can be holes in there that you didn't find yet. So you can also scan against running applications. Uh, and one of the, the tools that's out there is Zap, the Zap attack proxy, again from OWASP, uh, and this, uh, you can run like a default scan against it, uh, against your running application, and it will come up with uh, the common vulnerabilities, but you can also do complete uh, happy path and set path uh, scans. You have to build those. Um, <coughs> but then it also tries to input wrong information and see what happens. Uh, and again, you can put this in your CICD pipeline. Uh, and there's some other, uh, so the burp suite also tries to find uh, vulnerabilities. And, actually, and of course, just Nmap will tell you your SSL version is way too old. And in no particular order, you also have the actual functional test. So is your application doing what it should be doing. Um, and because most organizations want features, uh, we sometimes leave out the not features or uh, the stuff that's not supposed to happen and test for that. So that's known as bad path or evil path uh, and anti-personas. Uh, so you test um, from the perspective of somebody that was to steal money from you or um, when you have a shopping basket, if you can keep the items in the shopping basket but uh, change the amount you have to pay to zero. Uh, and you can test it in the same way as you test for, uh, for happy path things. Uh, with tools like Cypress, which uh, starts up a web browser and follows the paths you've uh, defined in that. A nice project that started with this tweet 
is the big list of naughty strings. It's um, just for comedy value, if you can look at it. It has uh, all the usual stuff in there, uh, so way too large uh, values. Uh, but all the uh, drop tables are in there, and emojis, and all the different Unicode uh, character sets. Uh, and this breaks a lot of applications. So this is the stuff that's relatively easy um, because um, you can do it within your team. I mean, all this software is freely available. You can pay for premium versions or supported versions, but you can just download it and start going uh, and, and just implement it. <coughs> for the... The slightly harder bit is when you go outside your team. And that's what happens when you go to world number two, security as a specialty. So we've been more or less been doing that, and now we want to have the testers and the security testers uh, involved. Uh, uh, we're going across the team boundaries, but it is possible. So what are patterns that work in organizations? Uh, well, they, they change their organization slightly. So they still have the security department or the risk department, uh, but they, they slightly change the attitude and the way of working um, to uh, have it married with uh, the DevOps world. Uh, and, you, and you find topics like this also under the DevSecOps or SecDevOps uh, uh, labels, whereas all the previous ones uh, is what like DevOps people uh, do. So security is a stakeholder. So security is sitting next to other uh, parts of the company uh, and security is uh, just requesting features uh, like marketing will uh, also request something or sales will request something. And the idea is that um, the way that the work flows to the team is the same for, for everybody. So all the security requirements and the security wishes are just put in the backlog. They are assigned a value, not as a value of zero, but an extra value so they get out of the backlog and into the to-do list. And an important one is that the security department uses the same ways of working and, and the same uh, tools as everybody else. Because too often it's, it's a different spreadsheet and, and different ways of working. Uh, and for instance, the second to last line, I definitely have seen a few times. Security does open a ticket, but with, <laughs> with a, a security scan reports of, please do something with this. Okay, yeah, that, that's a lot of work and I have no idea whether it's valuable or not. Uh, the other part is that security is, can instead of just asking you to do something, they can offer things. Uh, so it's um, a supporting team instead of uh, a customer and a stakeholder. Uh, the idea is that they're both. So how do you get started when you are a development team and uh, you don't know much about security? Uh, well, the security part department can train you, for instance. So read this, uh, watch this, uh, go to this course, internal course. And then it's a lot easier for the teams to actually come up with their own uh, security tickets. <coughs> then this one, um, the change advisory board. This is a picture of the last one I was in, uh, the one on the left, and then there's the <laughs> the security officer and the director of operations. What often happens is uh, in the security board, they look at documents, can we please change this? And in the document it says it's totally safe and it's risk-free and we have rollback plans and we thought of everything. Uh, and then they do the change and uh, well, and either works or not, but it's usually independent of what's handled in the change advisory board. But change management is still very important. As in the, the goal of the change advisory board 
is to, um, to uh, reduce risk on changes, although sometimes the way they do it is by uh, not allowing changes, then there is also no risk. Uh, in most ITIL uh, implementations, you have three types of changes. You have the normal changes, so they go through a change advisory board and they need documentation and rollback plans and stuff like that. <coughs> then you have standard changes, and that's the ones that beforehand you uh, agree with security and risk. Uh, under what circumstances can you do a change so it doesn't need approval from the CAP. And that is usually uh, what you're going to change is fully scripted, for instance. And it's done first on a development and a test and acceptance environment before you do it on production. You use the same scripts on all the environments. Um, that you use the four eyes principle, so uh, no changes in production that are driven by just a single person. Or what all the stuff I just agreed. So if you do this, 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 and this, then you don't need an approval because you already have the approval. And the third type of change is the emergent change. That is like the normal change, except you can do all the documentation after the fact because you have to change it right now, like a big vulnerability, fix it now, and then afterwards make the plan on how you were gonna fix it. And the idea there is that your normal way of working is so fast that you don't need emergency changes because from code commit to running in production uh, is counted in minutes anyway. Maybe tens or hundreds of minutes, but still minutes and not days, weeks, months. So what can the security department do? They, they can um, help you in all phases of the project. So they can help you with requirements. They can help you with de uh, design. Uh, they can help you uh, help with by running the stuff like SonarCube and uh, vulnerability scanners, uh, and by augmenting those tools because they have a default set they can work with, which you can make them specific for your application, your organization as well. I said earlier that um, you should store everything in Git or version control. Well, some stuff you don't want in there, and that's like your private keys, certificates, um, and passwords. So security can help with uh, secrets management systems. They can help with very targeted uh, scans of your application of your infrastructure. They can help with the logging and the metrics, is the detection. So how do, how do they do that, or how do we do that? Well, again, these OWASP folks, uh, they have stuff like the security knowledge framework, uh, which is extensive documentation on how you build uh, secure systems. So, um, and uh, you can map it to what you're building. So, for instance, when you have some kind of login and user management system, then they will have a list. Uh, when you store a password, do it like this. So, not plain text, but just the hash, stuff like that. Uh, and um, and the cheat sheets are the uh, are based on the same stuff, but so on. If this, please uh, check off uh, whether you're doing this, 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 and this. And this is all freely available uh, as well. Secrets management. Uh, well, we're still putting uh, passwords in text files, but at least now we're injecting them at uh, configuration management time uh, usually. Uh, but you can also store them in complete secret management systems. HashiCorp Vault is a popular one, uh, but the, the big providers uh, run uh, different kinds of secret management systems as well. And another open source project is uh, KeyWiz, uh, uh, where you can put in passwords and keys. So the Z-Proxy is something fairly lightweight, but you can also do extensive scans, and then you have uh, st uh, stuff like uh, Nessus and Metasploit. Uh, Metasploit is a meta tool, so it runs all the other tools. Uh, and the security department can also do um, uh, yeah, intensive pen testing, as in 
by analyzing the code, see how they can uh, break in. Uh, this is a big effort, but uh, usually too big to, for the team itself to handle. So this is something that the security people can team in. Uh, you can do blue team, red team exercises. So one team attacks and the other uh, team defends. Uh, and for instance, then you can test uh, whether you actually notice the attacks. Uh, and of course, uh, the security world is uh, big enough that they have their own conferences and events and, and groups. And, uh, and there is an overlap between the people that are here and the security uh, events. Uh, but uh, yeah, the security people tend to go to those. What can you do with logging? Well, logging is usually uh, done for uh, troubleshooting and then finding out uh, what went wrong. So how can you fix it? Uh, but logging will also tell you if somebody is trying to abuse your system. So what are the, the usual suspects? Well, 500 server errors. Often is somebody giving you data that your application didn't expect. So your application, uh, uh, well, crashes or uh, at least throws an error message. Uh, and often it's just programming that could be better, but uh, as in it just crashes uh, on its own, but it can also be an indicator of an attack. Database errors, so the, then the application passes something off to the database and the database says, uh, well, this string is not uh, what you should be giving me. Uh, SQL uh, injection. Just, just looking for the string uh, union all is a good indication somebody is trying to uh, uh, pass off SQL uh, to your database. <coughs> you can count logins, so how many failed logins in an hour versus how many uh, successful ones. Uh, the user password reset procedures are, are, often, well, are uh, used quite a bit to gain the credentials uh, because it goes through the email. And if an attacker has control of the email of a user, um, then they can get the password to your system as well. What else can security do? Well, auditing. So uh, they can look at the logs as well. It's not just uh, us. Uh, and uh, since we're using version control, and since we're using CICD pipelines, and since we're using fully automated uh, deploys and changes, all that uh, logs what it's doing, and then uh, instead of us looking at it, it can be the security people looking at it. Uh, and of course, they can make suggestions on what you should and should not be logging. logging. So what does a complete picture look like? Well, this is very simplified. But the idea is this. That, so Security department is already involved at the beginning, so when you have an idea for a new feature or a fix, that security is already involved as a stakeholder, as a customer, but also as an advisor on now how to best do it. Uh, when you're making the design, uh, stuff like the OWASP security framework has, when you're building and integrating, uh, use uh, the first control and the CI CD pipelines, and use tools like Sonar. Uh, test it when it's up and running, and then equip your production environment with enough logging uh, that auditors are available. So shift left, is that everything to the left? No, it's just that it, it's more to the left. So the security is so, still something that's uh, needed in all stages uh, of the process uh, until you shut down your system. Um, but uh, the idea is that the more you shift to the left, the more time you save uh, and money and effort at the end, and frustration, of course. Uh, a couple of books. Uh, the DevOps Handbook has a, has a nice chapter on security where a lot of this stuff is covered uh, in as well. The Nicole's book uh, just has like one page on security, uh, but an important one is that organizations that do a lot of this stuff on the shifting left, they spend half as much effort on security as organizations that don't do it. So that's a nice metric you can use um, uh, in your arguments uh, to shift things left. Uh, and of course I have to say that our DevOps Days Amsterdam 
has had a security check uh, a track for the last three years where stuff like this is discussed as well. So, um, I said that the second part is harder um, because uh, this doesn't happen automat automatically. Um, uh, still see loads of organizations where features, as in stuff that customers want, always get the highest priority, and then the, uh, the sad path and the security uh, features, um, yeah, uh, they get a value of zero. So if they are on the list, uh, they're left to last. A DevOps model will uh, help uh, with that, of course, and so everybody's involved with how stuff um, is running in production. Uh, then you also think about stuff like security and stability, but it's not easy. Um, also, security departments have for, uh, for years been trained into handling uh, spreadsheets and checklists. So, yeah, how do you get them involved in the daily work of coding? Um, quite a few security people do like it, but then the departmental structure is such that uh, it's hard uh, to do it. Uh, I don't have any answers for this. Um, and then I have a question for you. What did I miss? What can, can you suggest that we should be adding to this?